are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what is going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Dahl, writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC-related things. But on this podcast, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. On today's episode of Locked On Kentucky, we are going to be recapping Kentucky basketball's victory over the Providence Friars in the opening round of the NCAA tournament. Much to the chagrin of many a fan out there, the Wildcats got it done. And we're going to talk about how they got it done. We're also going to dive into looking ahead a little bit because this East region just got a whole lot more interesting. And to talk about that in a minute. Thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. I want to remind everybody out there that we are free and available on all platforms. If you are watching on YouTube, yeah, there's no reason you shouldn't subscribe. We are officially into the NCAA tournament. Wildcats looking to take on either Montana State or Kansas State in the second round on Sunday. Going to have a lot of coverage coming your way, so make sure you're subscribed. If you're watching the video live on YouTube as we broadcast this after Kentucky picks up the dub, please leave a like on the video. It would be much appreciated if you did that as well. So let's go ahead and get into it. Kentucky victors over the Providence Friar 61 to 53 was the final score there. I was not perfect in my prediction of how this game would play out, but there were a couple of things that did end up going Kentucky's way that we did discuss on the preview episode. Oscar Shibway, I think we need to start and end with him in this matchup. Obviously, he was not the most dominant when it came to scoring the basketball in this game. Didn't shoot any free throws, only had eight points on four of ten shooting. But what Oscar did for this offense is extremely valuable for what Kentucky wants to do moving forward in the NCAA tournament if they are going to continue to keep winning. Eight points, 25 rebounds in total for the big man. 11 of them were offensive, 14 of them were defensive, I just spoke with Isaac Shade of the Locked On College Basketball Podcast about this right before I went live. He asked me, how important is it for Kentucky's offense that Shibway is that guy down low grabbing all, uh, grabbing all these rebounds? It's crucial for a couple of reasons. Number one, I think is the fact, uh, think it's the fact that this team just doesn't have a lot of depth right now. Uh, as we observed in this game, zero points from Kentucky's bench. Zero. Going to talk about that in a second. You don't have a lot of options right now, so getting all of the second-chance opportunities that you can is crucial. Not having Severe Wheeler, we're going to discuss in, the second, uh, in a second, is, I've now come to realize, very important uh, for this team. Getting these extra opportunities with Oscar Shibwe and Toppin and Livingston down low, finding ways to keep the ball alive and to extend possessions is so important. I believe the color analyst for this game actually made a point uh, right as the second half began, it's kind of like in football whenever you're trying to extend time of possession, when you're trying to hold on to the ball, when you're trying to milk the clock in essence, but you're inadvertently doing it here in basketball by grabbing these extra offensive rebounds and you're trying to get these extra possessions. Oscar Shibway allows you to take possessions away from the opponent and give them to what is a limited rotation currently. It's a rotation that really likes to get to the rim, and I think the shot selection in this game is where I want to turn to next. Isaac also asked me, how did Kentucky kind of stay alive in the second half and kind of just cruise there for what felt like a majority of the second half, like the beginning and then the end? And it had to do with what, with what uh, Shibway was doing down low, but it also had to do with the fact that this team just kind of controlled pace and got to the rim, right? We've complained over and over and over this season about the fact that Kentucky has just kind of fallen short, uh, if you will, uh, when it comes to proper shot selection, good shot selection, statistically efficient shot selection. I'm not sitting here saying that Kentucky should look at numbers and rely solely on statistics for how they choose to run their offense, because that's not how call, that's not how sports work. It's not all about the numbers. There's also individual matchups and they have different things like that. But we have seen Kentucky's mid-range game come back and bite them in horrendous ways at different points this season. And you saw quite a bit of this mid-range game, but you saw something that I don't think you've seen 
in games like against Vanderbilt to end the season, in games where Kentucky has had opportunities in the past, you saw a lot of mid-range, but it was a lot of stuff inside the paint, right? It was a lot of these floaters. There were not a, there were not a ton of jumpers that were taken outside of the paint. If Kentucky can make their offense just a little bit more compact, I think that they will become a more efficient team offensively moving forward. If they are not going to have the rotation that they had at the beginning of the season, if they're not going to get any sort of production from their bench, then they have to have these guys that are in these in the starting five get downhill or look for an outside shot. That's the one of that's one of two things they need to do. I think the only two people that need to be taking sort of mid range ish floaters are Jacob Toppin and Antonio Reeves. Reeves proved at his previous stop at Illinois State that he could do it at a relatively high clip. He's done it at a pretty efficient clip so far this season. Toppin has shown in, at, at different points that he can knock down that shot, not at an extremely high level most games, but there are games where he turns it on. I think Reeves and Toppin need to be the two guys that kind of focus there. I'm tired of Case and Wallace, who went two for eleven tonight. Just another horrendous shooting performance. We'll get to him, and actually, I'll t- I'll care, uh, cover him in just a moment. I'm tired of Case and Wallace, and I'm tired of Chris Livingston taking these turnaround fadeaway, just like whenever the offense doesn't look like it's going anywhere, deciding to float it up, just kind of deci- deciding to just kind of flick it up, and uh, either outside the paint or just right there on it. You need better shot selection from your guards and forwards. You need more efficient. Shot selection. This is March. This is all you're going to get. If 61 points is the best that you could do with your entire starting five scoring and the first round, which it's great that you got the win, it's great that you played defense, you got to be able to make the best decision poss- uh, decisions poss- possible, possession in and possession out. Full stop. Jason Wallace in this game played 39 minutes, was 2 for 11, had 5 assists, only 1 turnover, he had 2 steals, 4 rebounds, He was solid in every single department outside of shooting the basketball. They need him to do one of two things. They need him to either stop taking these mid-range shots and give the ball up for different things, or they need him to make better decisions with the basketball. Straight up. And you don't have to be a bad decision maker with the basketball to look at somebody's stat sheet, pull it up and say, oh, well, they're a bad decision maker because they have a bunch of turnovers. No, you can have guys that don't turn the ball over, that are in control of what they're doing, but don't make good decisions whenever they have the basketball in their hand. They either pull it to the wrong guy in the offense or they decide to make their own decisions themselves within it within a certain set, and it ends up costing teams valuable possessions. They're, the possessions you have from here on out, I mean, they're all you get. You don't get a second chance after this. You don't get another game. This is the end of the season. Case and Wallace, for my money, has to step up as a shot creator for Kentucky or a distributor. I don't need him fogging up these mid-range shots. He's got to do a better job of it. He's got to do a better job of getting to the rim. And he did at different points in this game. I'm not saying that's completely absent from his game. And also, on top of this, he's hurt. It's clear he's not 100% right now. Kentucky has to play with what they have to play with. But you also have to ask a question. We've seen point guard Antonio Reeves before. Why do you not let him control the offense a little bit more than he does with the ball in his hands. Why not let him do that? He's proven that he can score before. I don't understand why you wouldn't give him the opportunity to try and maybe execute with the ball in his hands more often in the half court instead of being the guy off ball that's catch and shoot. He's very valuable in that department, as we saw tonight. But Case and Wallace, it's clear, over these past several games that he has been somewhat healthy, he's not performing. He went 3 of 10 against Vanderbilt. 2 of 7 against Vanderbilt before they played in the SEC tournament. He went 6 of 12 against Auburn in a game that didn't really matter halfway through. 2 of 8 against Florida. 1 of 13 against Mississippi State. 2 of 8 against Georgia in a loss. He's not been performing consistently down the stretch here. Kentucky has to find different options here, even though they're playing with a limited rotation. I know that it sounds contradictory for me to say they need other spots to go to. They've got four others. They've got Livingston, they've got Toppin, they've got Reeves, and they've got Sheway. All three of those guys, I think, are more efficient in the shot selection that Case and Wallace takes. Full stop. I, I think that Wallace needs to, t- to refocus what his position on this team is right now. Like, there is no, there's nothing else that Kentucky can do to fix it for the future because these are his last games, I believe, as a Wildcat. They've got to find a way 
to get him more comfortable and more in control of what he does as the freshman point guard. Or they need something else. I want to get to what that is in just a second. Before I do that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at FanDuel. The tournament is heating up, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book. New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000, and that's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. All you have to do is download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from money line to point scores, threes drained. You also can have player props like points, rebounds, assists, steals, all that good stuff. And on top of all of this, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. You can make every moment more with FanDuel, an official, uh, official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, continuing along here on the Friday edition of Locked On Kentucky, Lance Dahl hanging out here with you. Really appreciate everybody that is currently watching live. Got about 70-ish people in here. If you would, please go ahead and like the video. And if you're not subscribed already, please subscribe. It would mean a ton. Also, I mentioned it at the top. What am I doing? Go subscribe to the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, currently a top 10 basketball podcast in America. You've got to go check them out. I've told you guys so many different times before, Isaac Shade, Andy Patton do such a good job. They'll have some more content out for you tomorrow, recapping all these different things that have happened in the tournament. The biggest thing I think a lot of you are going to be interested in, which I will get to in a second, is Farley Dickinson beating Purdue. That's right. Another 16 over one upset has happened for just the second time in NCAA tournament history. A 16 seed has toppled a one seed in the tournament. This region that Kentucky is in all of a sudden is wide open for anyone to take. I'm going to get to that later on in the show, but I'm so excited about what the guys over there at the Locked On College Basketball Podcast are doing, you have to go check them out. They're wherever you get your podcast, or you can search them up on YouTube. All right, I want to get to what Kentucky needs if Wallace is not going to be the dude to score the points, which I think he's proven over these past 10 games or so that he's not going to be the dude to score the points for them. He's going to be either a distributor or he's going to be somebody that takes shots that he doesn't make. I mean, it's just it's, it's straightforward at this point. And I'm not criticizing the kid's character. I think he's a great kid. He's a very solid defender. And it's maybe what more of what Cal wants him to do in this offense. You can put the blame on him instead if you feel like it. I'd be comfortable with that. There has to be something done about it, though. If they want to switch it up, they could also get Severe Wheeler back. Obviously, that's not in their hands to necessarily control. I mean, it is at the end of the day. It's their decision to put him out there or not, but... It's his health that has been limiting him since February 4th. It's been preventing him from getting back on the court. If he returns for Kansas State, that will be so big for Kentucky. Even if he's not 100%, Kentucky needs another point guard. Straight up. If they're not going to get the outside shooting, if they're not going to get uh, if they're not going to get Casey Wallace playing well, they need to have severe severe Wheeler out there as somebody else that can play the point and can get to the rim. You need to have one more guy out there that can do that, that can make people respect Oscar Sheepway and Jacob Toppin and respect your outside shooters. C.J. Frederick has been, and I, uh, again, I'm not trying to criticize these kids' characters. He's not been anything for Kentucky since he's returned. I mean, it would almost have been better if he had just sat out even if he's an extra body for four or five minutes, it would have almost been better if he had just sat out and kind of made sure that he is back to full health because he's not done anything. He came in to this game, and he immediately, when he checked in, gave up, uh, gave up points on the fast break. He couldn't do anything. He wasn't tall enough to defend Bryce Hopkins getting to the rim, and he wasn't physical enough to contest it. He would, he, all he did was put his arm up and foul him. It was a foul and one. And then later on, just a few minutes later, after I am tweeting, hey, he should be pulled out of the game, he gives up a mid-range jumper to somebody in an ISO situation. He's not what Kentucky needs off the bench right now. They need somebody like Wheeler. They need somebody that can handle the ball and at least do something, contribute something on one end of the floor. Because as, as, as much as people, including myself, have criticized Severe Wheeler in the past, I think that he has been 
the ball handler for this team that has made things go at times, and he has also been a threat. He may not be the most efficient shooter, but he is a threat to score. C.J. Frederick is not a threat to score on the floor right now for the Wildcats. They've got to find they've got to find answers. Getting Severe Wheeler back will be so important for this team. Where else do I want to venture? I think overall you have to look at the fact that Kentucky out rebounded the Friars forty eight to thirty one in this game and just kind of took control on the boards. I mean, this was just a more physical outing from Kentucky. They were just a the, the more significantly physical team uh, on the boards. Now we'll say this. There was, I wouldn't say poor, terrible officiating in this game, but they were not, the officials were, they were letting a lot of stuff go. And I'm not saying, oh, the Wildcats got mistreated on, 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 uh, by the officials. No, I'm saying both ways. I'm saying there was a lot, and I mean a lot, on some of these rebounds for both sides. There was a lot of hip checks, a lot of hand checks, a lot of, a lot of physical play when it came to fighting through screens to cover guards from Providence. There were so many things that in past SEC games we have seen get called both ways. The officials let it go today. I mean, that is part of the reason why both teams scored so low. They they let a lot of stuff go. There could have been a lot more free throws taken in this game. Just 24 combined from both sides. Kentucky shot 13. Providence shot 11. There was just a lot of bumping and grinding down low immunity. Um, from from both of these teams, and it was just kind of let go. Let's see, Michael Bell right now looks like it, uh, Kansas State has their hands full with Montana State, and I need to pull that score up in a second. Kentucky is still in Greensboro on Sunday. Yep, one t- what time, Frank? I don't know. I need to check that. I actually don't think it's come out yet, and that's what that's actually what Swan said. Uh, and then JJ says, just think Purdue lost to St. Peter's last year too. Bad night to be a little, uh, Boilermaker. Sure, let's go ahead and get to what this region looks like with the Wildcats advancing now. So we've talked about, I think, everything that we want to talk about in the... Oh, no, there is one more thing I want to get to for this game. Bryce Hopkins. So I said it, and some of you were were not as optimistic as I was. Some of you were. Some of you were more optimistic than I was. I said, I don't know if Kentucky can shut down Bryce Hopkins, but I think they can at least limit him. I will go as far as to say he will not be operating at as high of a level as he has in games past. He's averaged over 16 points a game. He had seven. He had four turnovers and four personal fouls. He was 0 of 3 from 3. He was 3 of 5 from the foul line. He was 2 of 9 from the floor in 39 minutes of action. Kentucky shut his stuff down. All due respect to Bryce Hopkins for making himself a name at another school after transferring from Kentucky. I think it's great that he went out and he found a spot that he's comfortable with and he's thriving in. In this game, though, Kentucky had his number. I mean, they made Ed Croswell beat beat them. They made Carter beat them. They made Bynum beat them, and the, and the other guys couldn't. Now, Croswell had himself a good game uh, offensively in terms of, of shooting, but Bryce Hopkins didn't get anything against this Kentucky defense. Overall, I think we have to be impressed with the fact that Kentucky, for the most part, has not been an elite defensive team so far this season, and they held Providence to 53 and you may say, well, Providence isn't, isn't like crazy or anything like that. Do you remember what we talked about in the, in the preview episode? We talked about Providence averaging over 80 or 78 points a game. This is one of the most efficient offenses in the country. They're a top 15 offense. And Kentucky held them to 53. And they shut down their best player. That's great. You couldn't ask for anything better. It's perfect. That was, it was a perfect defensive game plan. I think from Kentucky, a lot of open, miss, uh, open shots were missed. Sure, from both sides, but man, that was great. Okay, I want to get I want to get to the bracket here. I want to get to bracket here. Let's see. Is there anything else? Is there anything? Else? Well, yeah. Swan makes a good point. While the officiating was like letting a lot of things go, it wasn't it wasn't shifted to one side. It was even. I, I was I was content. I was content with the way that the officiating was. Would rather see a game like this uh, than a game with 45 uh, fouls called. Austin is, is exactly right. That's exactly right. You don't want to see choppy pace because the officials want to get the, insert themselves into the game. Oh, and, and Biker points out something. I didn't even talk about this. There was a dead ball on the rim of a free throw. Uh, I think at like midway through the first half, 
Providence was shooting a free throw, and the ball rims out and comes back up and then just dies on the back of the rim. And it sits there, and it doesn't move. And uh, I, I forget what, what Iron Eagle said, but he was like, oh, we've got a sticker or something like that, something really funny. But, uh, yeah, that was just some, some very strange, oh, we've got a sitter is what he said. Very strange things that happened in this game. Uh, Tung Pai says, sorry, I didn't hear anything. I have a question about the Kentucky next game. Who are they playing against? It's either going to be Montana State or it's going to be Kansas State. I'm going to pull this up right now, and I uh, I apologize for anybody that's watching this post live um, that is trying to figure out what exactly is going on. Let's see. Just pull up scores real real quick. Montana State is down 21-23 with 7 minutes and 43 seconds left in the first half against Kansas State. Yeah, so they're battling out. By the way, if, if I'm very sniffly, I want to apologize. Um, I'm still getting over some type of cold thing. Uh, homeboy does not feel great, but this win definitely made him feel uh, just a little bit better. So the tournament right now. Uh, hey, guys, I don't know if you saw it, but um, the one seed in the uh, in the East region is gone. Purdue is gone. They lost to Farley Dickinson. 60, uh, I believe it was... 63 to 58 was the final score there. Only the second time ever that a one seed uh, has lost. It is um, all of a sudden, I don't want to say it's wide open for Kentucky because they still have to get past Marquette and they still have to get past either Montana State or Kansas State or whoever they play. Um, it, it's, it's perfect. It, it, it is perfect. I think for, for, for Kentucky right now, what has happened thus far uh, in, in, this, in this region, because Purdue was the, was the biggest threat. Now, Duke also um, is, uh, is another massive threat, as we've, as we've seen after they, uh, after they played against Oral Roberts. So I'm, say, I'm sitting here saying, like, any team in this bracket, or excuse me, in this region, it's wide open for, but Kentucky's pa- path just got a lot easier. After what happened tonight... I, nothing but thumbs up. Nothing but thumbs up for Farley Dick, uh, Dickinson. I would love to see them take out either Memphis or Florida Atlantic just to really make me feel good about what's going on here. Uh, but we'll just have to see. But man, this has a chance to be a pretty chaotic region. Marquette looks solid uh, in their opening round game against Vermont. We'll have to see what they look like uh, in their second round game against Michigan State. Michigan State could be a team Kentucky re, uh, uh, rematches against. That could be a fun, uh, fun one. Uh, JJ says, I want the Duke game. Great Kentucky and says, I want, I think Duke goes to the Elite Eight. Ultimate Swan said, stay, stay away from that one seed. You said, little did you know they lose to, to FDU. I was saying that before the bracket started. And at the same time, I, I, do, I do hold that position because would you rather play Providence or would you rather play, play Memphis? And I'm not saying for the storylines, I'm saying for the matchup. Would you rather play Providence or Florida Atlantic? I think that a lot of people would still right now sit here and say that they would much rather play a team like Providence who proved to have a bad offensive outing than a team like Memphis or a team like Florida Atlantic who has, I would argue, significantly more talent all around. Uh, And both of them have uh, just a a lot of things going for them in terms of what they do on the offensive end uh, or what they've done so far this season. I am holding back a sneeze like it's like like nobody's business right now. Uh, Cassandra said Kentucky loses ne- next game. I hope not. I hope not. There was one more thing I wanted to get to here before we before we decided to head out. <laughs> Let's see. Is there anything else I wanted to get to? I need to sneak. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. I apologize for anybody on podcast that that was a little too loud for. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, that was rough. Is there anything else I want to get to here? I mean, other than that, I think I got to, to everything. Kentucky with a short rotation, no points from their bench, solid defense, great outing for Sheepway. Great outing for Toppin, too. 6 of 14, made all of his free throws after not clutching up against Vanderbilt in the SEC tournament. That's great. This really does look like a tourney anyone can win. You are absolutely right. Potent. Um, holy cow, what a, what a first couple of days of the, of the NCAA tournament, man. I mean, they have just been awesome. I was in Birmingham uh, for several games. Uh, just a, just a night ago. I'll be back there tomorrow. Um, it, it's, it's a really fun time, man. It, it's a really fun time. Uh, so again, I just want to remind everybody, if you have not subscribed to the show already, please go ahead and do so. Uh, by the way, actually, while we're here, 
let's give an update on the uh, on the uh, bracket pool <laughs> um, in uh, in the uh, in the locked on Kentucky bracket pool. So over fifty of you joined, which I want to say thank you so much for. And I think we got a little bit of a problem. If I command F, Kentucky, there are twenty three brackets that have decided, or twenty. There are let's see. No, there are 21 brackets that have chosen Kentucky to go win the national title in our bracket pool. Um, and let's see, four or three of the top five brackets in the pool right now, including Isaacs, who I don't know if he's in the live uh, right now. But what's up, Isaacs, if you're here? Uh, three of you pick Kentucky. And a lot of you seem to be pretty negative in chat about Kentucky. So I'm a little surprised by that, to be completely honest with you. Matt's bracket currently leads the way. It's tied with Mosher and Fit, uh, Fit Cody. Uh, and and Bree as well, uh, with 230 points apiece through this round one. I don't even want to talk about where my bracket is, man. I went I went pretty chalk, I think, and the couple of upsets that I picked were wrong. I think next year, yeah, I I, I I think everybody says that. I think next year I'll do this and it'll be better. Um, but I, I think next year I'm probably just going to be a lot more chaotic. Hopefully, I come back to this and I remember that. So. Really appreciate everybody watching. Again, if you've not subscribed, if you've not liked the video already, please go ahead and do so. If you have any questions about this game, if you have any questions about what Kentucky could be doing moving forward, you can leave those in the YouTube comments below on this one. You can also uh, hit me on the socials. And that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked on Kentucky. Hey, you can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on UK. You can follow me on Twitter at Lance Dahl underscore. And you can follow the show on Instagram. That is over at Kentucky podcast again questions comments concerns you can leave them in the comments below or hit me on the socials i will see you all tomorrow I'm gonna try and do another episode of locked on kentucky hope you guys have a great rest of your day cameras being weird and god bless <laughs>